I know you guys want to go to lunch, but we have one more. And uh, I don't know if, if you're actually following the web tweets, you must have seen our next speaker because he's like, I call him the Twitter machine. He tweets like a madman all the time. Uh, so please welcome Kevin Marks. Hi, Hi Kevin. Hi there. Good luck. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Kevin Marks. I'm here to talk about um, The Web We Found, which is a title I got from um, Anil Dash's post, The Web We Lost, um, where he lamented the changes in the web over the last 10 years. So what I want to talk about is the web that I found 10 years ago when I, when I um, started out on the web and how it's changing now. So 10 years ago in 2003, I left Apple I sold my stock at $10, so don't take my predictions as, as good um, financial tips. Um, and I joined a, a small startup called Technorati. Um, so at Apple, I'd been building um, video software for the operating system, and I switched to Technorati to um, an open source software stack, which was, a, which was a new experience for me then. I'd been inside Apple using proprietary software, and there was, this, there was this lovely stuff there that was open source. Anyone could rebuild it. I didn't have to work for the company that built it to change it. That was a powerful thing. But out there on the client in the 2003 web, this wasn't the case at all. The browser war was over. IE6 had won, um, and the W3C had basically given up on HTML and said XML is going to take over. So that was a bit worrying. There was this, there was this sense that um, the web that we knew was, was changing and coming to an end. Or was it? Around the same time, there were pe other people saw this and were worried about it. So Firefox was beginning quietly. Um, WebKit was happening inside Apple. Um, and the What WG was formed, which was the group that um, invented what is now called HTML5, but then was called um, HTML for apps. And it was a set of developers who were actually trying to build the web themselves um, based on these two groups and, and Opera and some others as well who were worried that um, the web shouldn't be defined by one large company's piece of code. So that was that, that um, 10 years ago we, th we thought there was um, this huge hegemony um, but the seeds of its um, overthrowing were, were, were there already. So in 2003 what, what was mobile like? Um, I had a wonderful mobile device in 2003. This is the Sidekick One. It has an app store, it has a web browser, it does email, it does instant messaging. It was, and um, we ran all our op stuff at Technorati there using this on AIM. Um, it was years ahead of its time, and the, the guys who built it eventually left and went and joined Google to build Android. But the, the, again, the seeds of mobile were there 10 years ago, even though at the time we didn't necessarily see it. Um, and what about social? So, you know, now we think social is this huge thing, but w did we have a social web um, 10 years ago? Well, there was this site called Friendster, and there was this um, chap you may recognize there, Mark Zuckerberg, was a keen user of it. Um, and did we have a real-time web in 2003? No. Google updates its, its index once a month. Um, they, they, you know, they'd invented MapReduce and Hadoop and all that stuff, but they only ran it once a month with the web index. So you're, as you, when you posted websites, um, there wasn't a sense that it was changing rapidly enough for that to matter. Um, so they call this the Google dance, um, which meant that um, every month or so, all the, index, all the search rankings would, would get um, shuffled and changed, and everyone was pa panicked about that. And the, w the way you got to things on the web then were portals. We had your home page, Yahoo and MSN, and that was the, the main route people used to the web. The, the search engines were rising, but there wasn't this, this other, other sense. So what happened? What changed? Blogging came along. Blogging was how we actually built a, a parallel social um, web overlaid on, the, on the, the web we were all using. Personal publishing pages, um, they were connected through pinging each other, and they, were, and they were updated in minutes. And what we were building at Technorati was a way to ease that, to crawl all these blogs, um, and to index them within minutes rather than once a month, which is a, you know, a huge speed up. You know, now we worry about milliseconds, but minutes was quite significant 10 years ago. Um, so the key thing that, that, made the, the, that I found when I, when I met that web was that the, there were open specs that defined how it was supposed to behave um, 
that were built out by these different companies and connected together and were interoperating. There was the edge of that not being true because of the IE6 problem, but th the spirit was still there that, that founded the web 10 years before that. Um, and with the open source backend and, and the stuff there, the, 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 the seed was set for, the, for these, um, this web to, to regrow. Um, and over the next 10 years, new devices came along. So, so the, you know, the sidekick was, was kind of an anomaly in, in, in that it was ahead of its time, but what we saw with the, you know, with the iOS devices, with BlackBerry, with Android, they all started out with a good web browser and the apps came later. Um, and they, they would rapidly update the, the, the browsers. So the work that was going on inside Apple, at the time we thought they were just building a browser for the Mac. In fact, they were setting the, um, the, the groundwork for the, um, the browser on iOS that, that became, then became the basis of the browser for Android as well. And Chrome, come to think of it. Um, the other thing that happened was that blogging was absorbed into these social silos. Um, the, the social networks grew up and, and spread out, um, and they became much more mainstream than the, than the blogging thing, which was still fairly hard to use, um, and required quite a lot of commitment to read and post and read and post. And this has been streamlined through better user experience by Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and everyone. But they have made the um, experience more streamlined, but much more um, constrained in many ways. So, Coming to today's mobile, what do we have? Mobile has now displaced the desktop. The biggest OS in the world is now Android by, a, by a quite a large margin. And that's interesting. That means we've got an open source operating system as well as open source on the server. Um, IE is now irrelevant. The, the browser market share of IE is not something anyone looks at anymore when they're developing, um, unless they're in a very constrained environment inside, inside a company that hasn't changed their computers in 10 years. Um, in social, this has almost gone the other way. We have these consolidated silos that feel a bit like the IE6 felt like um, 10 years ago. You, you, you're, we're starting to, f from being an exciting place to develop on, um, as IE6 was when it first came out, you know, a few years before that, Facebook and, and Twitter and these other places are starting to feel like they're putting constraints on you. The previous speaker was saying Facebook is deciding who gets to, to see your stuff, and they're, they're taking control of it rather than you using them. So that's a... That's a challenge. Links still, but there's still the place where links spread. Um, he, yeah, he said that too. Twitter and, and Facebook are the places that you, you spread out links to, to other people. So that's, um, there is that flow of information going through, um, but the links to the rest of the web do matter. And there are some myths that I'm, I'm starting to hear over the last um, couple of years that apps will replace the web, that, that mobile will take over, that Facebook is your website, you shouldn't have your own site anymore, and the mobile is some special thing that is different from the, the web that we had before. And I think all three of these are, are untrue. Um, an app is really just a browser that only works on, webs on one website. You've got a very specialized browser that just reads Facebook, that just reads Twitter, that just reads something, um, and you have to go and choose that specifically rather than get to anything else. It's not, you know, it's not some you know, magic new thing. It's a, it's a constrained version of the thing we have. Um, and Facebook is the new portal. Facebook has become the, the Yahoo, the MSN, the place you go to first to jump off to other places on the web. And it's starting to feel a bit like the Yahoo of 10 years ago, which, you know, which was, again, you know, everybody's front page to the web at the time. But it's, you're starting to feel that, that same sense of, um, yeah, everyone's here, but it's not the exciting place it was five years ago when I started using it. Um, and mobile screens are now primary. The, the, the notion of mobile being a separate special thing is, is, feels kind of dated when I've got, a, you know, I've got a mobile phone with a 1080p screen. It's got more pixels than my laptop. Um, it, the, this, this is spreading now. The, the tablets have converged as well. The, the notion that mobile and tablets were separate things has gone as well. There's now this continuum of these little screens that we use, and the way we use them is very similar between whether it's the thing in our hand or sitting on our lap or with the keyboard attached. That, that distinction of very small screens and large screens that you do different things on has gone away entirely. Um, structurally, though habitually that, that isn't necessarily true. People still use them differently, but that's just because they've habituated themselves to that. I think we'll see that, that vanish soon as well. 
So to take a long-term view, to say what will happen in 10 years, I want to extrapolate from the, the, you know, the conclusions I've drawn here already. Um, what I want to say is that the, the open stuff outlast companies. Um, we've seen companies come and go over the last 10 years. That, uh, you know, the, I, can, I, can, I can joke about you know, Friendster and, and, and the phone I had 10 years ago, but the stuff that they built there outlasted the companies, and the bits that outlasted it was the stuff that was designed as an open protocol that wasn't bound into one company's way of working. The other thing is that um, open protects people because they're not then trapped in, that, in the destiny of that company. When that, um, the difficulty is that when your site goes away, whether it's shut down, whether it's bought by somebody else, or they just have a disaster, all your data can go with it. If you have, if you have an open flow of data between sites, that, that protects you as well. And open saves effort. The, the reason we have um, been able to replace large numbers of devices um, over this cycle has been because we've had these open, open protocols and open source implementations of those protocols. So that when, when Apple made the wise decision to build WebKit um, uh, you know, 10 years ago, they actually set the seeds for, for Android and for Chrome and for the effective um, overthrow of Microsoft as the, as the, the, the dominant player in the, in, on the web and even in the, on the operating system. So, how do I project this forward? There's a, there's a group called the IndieWeb, which, which I've been paying attention to over the last year. And I think that's, that's the marker for me of what I was seeing 10 years ago with the rise of blogging and with this, this software going on underneath when it looked like um, the, um, IE6 had won the, the web. So the, the, the IndieWeb's you know, goals are to say, OK, we understand there are all these social silos and, and things that, that are important, but you shouldn't, forget, shouldn't neglect the, to have your own website. And what we're seeing is that developers are making tools to help you build your own website, but use these silos to connect to the people who are using them. So it's not, it's not building something that's designed to be a Facebook replacement, a Twitter replacement. It's designed to use the infrastructure that those places have built to connect the, the rest of the web together and to make sure that it's resilient against any one of those going away. Um, and there's a set of indie web principles that I'm going to go through fairly quickly here. Um, because they, you know, they, seem, they seem obvious to me based on the history I've just described. You should own your own data. You should have your own site that's not um, a Facebook page, you know, a, a Google Buzz page, I mean, plus page. Um, there's not some site that's going to disappear. There was a time when having your, your, your band on MySpace was the most important thing you could do, and that, that didn't last very long. Um, I've seen the same thing with companies suddenly deciding that their Facebook page was more important than their web page, and now they're starting to realize that means that Facebook can squeeze them out of the feed and, and build them to, put, to buy adverts to go back into it again. Um, you should have visible data. One of the things that made Google possible and what made Technorati possible 10 years ago was that you could crawl the web. You could go and fetch web pages, index them, make sense of them, and um, share them out to other people. That ability has been taken away as these social silos have been built up. You can't crawl Facebook anymore. Um, they block Google. You can't even write a crawler unless you pretend to be a browser. You can't crawl um, Twitter anymore. They started out being crawlable. Now big chunks of the stuff you want to crawl from Twitter, you have to log in to get first, and you have to go and do a biz dev deal with them to read it. And there, while you can call, crawl quite a lot of Google+, Plus, there are bits of it that you can't get to, um, again, without um, signing up and, and um, getting a biz dev deal to, to fetch enough. I was talking to a developer last night, and he said, yeah, if it wasn't for Tor, I wouldn't be able to crawl these sites at all, because he's having to pretend he's somebody else to get a crawl going. Um, the, other th so the other principle is what we call posse. Publish on your own site, syndicate elsewhere. And this is key. This is make sure that you're putting your stuff in your own place, but link it out on, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest, on whatever comes along next week. Um, you know, Gary Vee was saying you should use Snapchat for that too, which I think is going a little far. But um, see what channels are available there, but make sure that you're spreading links to your own stuff, because that's the stuff that they can't take down from you. Um, and the other thing is, there's, there's, this, is, this is more for the engineers, is make tools for you 
Um, don't make tools that you think someone else will use. Um, if you don't use it yourself, no one else will. You know, one of the key lessons here is um, Odeo was the, was the company that spawned Twitter. And they thought, we're going to make a great tool for people sharing and listening to podcasts. But none of them actually did that. So they built this tool with this notional user in mind. And then halfway, you know, halfway through that, they said, wait a minute, this, no, we don't really care about this. But fortunately, they found something else to do, which is why we, why we have Twitter. Um, document what you do. This is, this is really key. If you, um, it's very, very easy to document stuff on the web, make sense of it, and publish it. Um, if you're building tools to share on the web, this should be a natural part of what you do. The, the notion that you should build stuff in secret and not share it means that you're losing the ability for other people to um, help you out with it. And open source the, the stuff you make, because the open source infrastructure is the stuff that lasts. Um, that's the, you know, you, you can only gain other people helping you build it. And what you, what open source has this strange power, which is if you're a developer and you open and you open, work on open source software, you can leave the company and still work on it, and you haven't lost that work. As a developer, that's great. But the other half of that equation is if you're a company and you hire a developer to work on open source software, if he if he or she leaves the company, they will still work on the code and still fix bugs in it. So you're you're managing to um, preserve the, the, the your code base even when you're your staff leave, which is that's, that, that's a very powerful effect. And what it means is that these open source projects outlast any given company, because a project in a company is only um, going to last as long as the management chain understands it well enough. And that, that's a fragile thing. Um, the, the another principle is that designing user experience is really important. Um, it's, there's an engineering thing where you start making protocols and building the protocols, and then you build the design on top. Um, and what you find is that makes you um, go too broad. And you think about all the possible things that can go wrong and build that into your protocols. And then you try and build the design and find that you've got 100 things you've got to build into the design. So iterate the design first, make the flow of the design and the use of it work. And then that will help you decide which bits of the protocol actually matter. And another principle is be modular. Um, don't try and build everything. This, this is related to the posse idea. Make sure that you can build pieces that plug together um, and that can fail individually and then can reconnect to other pieces. That also means that you can swap pieces out. So you can start out saying, OK, I don't want to build a login system. I'll use a third-party login system like Twitter or Facebook or Google. Um, but if you build it in, in a modular way, you can both swap in more than one of those, but also you could replace it with your own later if you decide that's, that's worth doing. Um, and the, other, the final thought is to think about the long web. To, to think on these 10-year, 15-year time frames and say, am I making something that will last, or am I making something that, that will disappear? Um, expect what you make to last. Um, expect it to be preserved. Um, don't destroy the history of the stuff you have, and keep copies elsewhere. Now, I know this is you know, pushing against the, 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 the Snapchat trend that Loic has been pushing on everyone here. Um, but I think it, you know, if you have ephemeral stuff that's designed to go away, that's great. It'll go away. But the stuff that's designed to last um, will last and will be shared, and that will actually be what makes history. And finally, bet on the web. Open, outlast, closed. Um, for, for the reasons that I've said already, but you know, if you just look at the history of this, um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's self-evident that these open specs and open protocols um, have the resilience to last you know, um, tens of years and, and will last even longer, and build infrastructure that um, other people can build on as well. And that's it. Um, if you're interested in IndieWeb, search for it. But um, IndieWebCamp.com is the, is the group that's um, organizing this and trying to hear people and get them to talk to each other. Thank you very much. What do I go out? Thank you very much, Kevin. Okay. Here's a close to a very interesting morning. And uh, at 2 p.m., we'll have Marco Tempest, the magician, here. And so uh, he's going to set up everything now uh, very fast. So please be there on time because it's going to be amazing. Marco is, is back and uh, he has a lot of gear. So please be there at 2 p.m. See you at 2. Have a good lunch.